Hi everyone, and welcome to this introduction to quantum computing. I'm very happy to present to you today the basic concepts of quantum computing. In the two hours, we will talk in the first hour about the difference between bits and qubits, about the direct notation and density matrices, which are ways to describe quantum states, then about measurements, about probabilities to measure different quantum states, and about a block sphere, which is a nice illustrative representation of quantum states. Then in the second hour, we will talk about quantum circuits. So I will introduce you to basic single qubit and two qubit gates. We will talk about multi multi multi-partite quantum stage states, which are states on multiple qubits. And then we will talk about entanglement and bus states. So that then for we're all set for tomorrow when we will introduce the first quantum algorithms and discuss them. So let's start with bits and qubits. I'm sure you've all seen classical computation and you know that classical states that are used for computation are can usually have one of two different values. So they are either zero or one. Now in quantum mechanics, that is a bit different, which is why we're so excited about it, because a state cannot only be in either zero or one, but it can actually be in what we call a superposition. And don't worry if you're not familiar with that word yet. What it means is that it can simultaneously be in both zero and one. These superpositions, so being in zero and one at the same, same time, then allow us to perform calculations much faster because they allow us to perform the calculations On, many, on all those many states at the same time. Now I'm saying many and not just two, because assume you have three bits. In classical computing, you could, with that, represent any number between zero and seven. Now in quantum mechanics, if each of these three then qubits, quantum bits, is in a superposition, we can actually be in a superposition of all those eight numbers at the same time. And that means we can also perform a calculation on all these eight numbers at the same time. This means that we can construct some quantum algorithms that can potentially give us some exponential speed up. However, there is a very big but, because what we have to consider is that once we measure these quantum states, so once we measure a superposition state, and actually collapses into one of its eigenstates. So instead of getting all results, if we, let's say we have these three qubits and we do calculations on all those eight states at the same time, then we are in the end in a superposition of all the eight answers. However, once we want to read it out, once we actually measure and observe it, it will collapse and we will only see one of the answers. This means that it is actually not that easy to find some useful or design some useful quantum algorithms. And that's why there's a lot of active research on it. But what we can do, so of course, if we only, if it wouldn't be useful at all, there wouldn't be so much hype around it. But what we can do is we can use what we call interference effects
which you might have heard of before in like the context of, for example, the double slit experiment where you have light going through two different slits and then you have interference patterns. Or also with sound waves, you might have heard of these interference effects where you have constructive and destructive interference. And this is the same thing, that the same principle that we can use here. We can have different amplitudes that can be positive or negative and of different size and in fact even imaginary. And these Inter these amplitudes can then cancel each other out. So, for example, if we construct some search algorithm, we can construct it in a way that all the wrong answers cancel each other out, and then only the right answer remains. So, in this way, we can still use the fact that we can calculate on all different states at the same time and give them even different amplitudes and different faces. We can use that to then design some smart algorithms that are, in the end, um, faster than classical computation. But as I said, it's really not that easy because you cannot just do all calculations in superpositions and then get all the results much faster. That's why we do active research on it. So now in order to describe quantum states, I need to introduce to you the Dirac notation and what we call density matrices. So the direct notation is used to describe quantum states. Actually, both density matrices as well. So we start, let's say, with two numbers, A and B, or actually they're not numbers, but they're two dimensional vectors with complex entries. So we say then C2, and then we define a so-called ket. So the ket of, for example, state A is something where we just, so we put these signs on the left and on the right of it. That's how a ket looks like. And this is just a normal column vector that has the two numbers A0 and A1 that can both be complex. Then we also define a bra. A bra, here we have just the signs the opposite way. And it's actually the same as if we take the cat of B and then take the dagger. So we have B0, B1, dagger. And what dagger means is that we take the complex conjugate and transposed of that vector. So transposed means we turn a column vector into a row vector. So we get B0 and be one like this. And then complex conjugated means that we here have the star. So if initially we had some number x plus i times y, where x and y are just some real numbers and i is the imaginary i, then taking the, the complex conjugate would give x minus i y. Yeah. OK. Um, so this is the bra. And then we can put these things together and get a bracket. So it means we take a bra, let's take the bra B, and then the cat A, and now we only need one line in the middle, not two. And so we multiply a row vector with a column vector, which is just taking the inner product, and we get A0 times B0 star plus A1 times B1 star. And Actually, this is even the same as if we just take the bracket of A and B and then complex conjugate it. And it's just a complex number. Now we can also do the opposite. And instead of taking the inner product of a bra and a cat, we take first a cat and multiply it with a bra. So we have, for example, A, B. And now note that this here, that's not an X. It's actually one side belongs to the cat of A and the other side belongs to the bra of a, B. And if we take a column vector and multiply it with a row vector, we get a matrix. In this case, a two by two matrix, which has the entries A0, B0 star, A0, B1 star, A1, B0 star, 
and a one b one star. So just a two times two matrix. Now, um, analogously to having the computational states zero and one, the bits that we have in classical computing, we also define in quantum computing our two pure states, zero and one, zero, which is, which we define as just the vector one, zero, and then we have the state one, which you define as zero, one, and we can check that these are actually orthogonal. So if we take the inner product of zero and one, we get one times zero plus zero times one, which is zero. So if the inner product of two vectors is zero, and that means that these two vectors are orthogonal. Good. So we have two orthogonal vectors, our two bits, our qubits, zero and one. That represent those. And then we can now look at if we if we look at the matrix that we get when we take the cat zero and bra zero. So we get our vector one zero as a row vector times one zero as a column vector, which gives us the matrix one zero zero zero. And analogously if we take cat1 bra1, we get 0, 1 times 0, 1, so 0, 0, 0, 1, these two matrices. This means that in general, any matrix, which I now call, now call row with the elements row 0, 0, row 0, 1, and so on, can be described just with a direct notation instead of writing it as vectors and matrices, we can just write it as a sum of Dirac operators. So we have the first number row zero zero times zero zero, because as we saw, this is, yeah, this matrix up there, plus row zero one times zero one, which would give us a matrix that has just the one at the right upper corner and so on. like that. Okay, and now the reason we introduced the direct notation is because all quantum states in any superposition with any correlations, anything can be described by what we call density matrices. which are normalized, positive, permission operators. And we usually just call them row. So normalized means that the trace of row must be one, then they need to be positive, and they need to be Hermitian. And what it means for a density matrix as defined above. So a trace of row, just as a reminder, would be in this case of the row as given above, it would be row zero zero plus row one one, which would need to be one. And then positivity, what we mean is actually semi-positive. Uh, semi it needs to be semi-positive definite. So we need for that, it needs to hold that if I take any arbitrary vector or state, <laughs> actually vector psi, and I sandwich my row between these, vec these vectors, so psi is in both cases the same one, but I take, so I have a row vector, any an arbitrary times my density matrix times another, times the column vector of the, sa the same one, and this needs to be larger or equal than zero to be positive semi-definite. And for any psi. 
And it's actually also equivalent to have all eigenvalues of rho being larger or equal than zero. And then the Hermitian, 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 Hermitian operator is defined by, so to take the Hermitian of a density matrix, it means that uh, to take the, we're taking the complex conjugate and transposed of the matrix. So we take, which means that we basically um, you, uh, flip the elements. So we reflect on the diagonal. So we get here the elements as before, but with these two swapped. And then we also complex conjugate each of the elements. And this needs to be the same as rho, which immediately tells us that rho zero zero and rho one one actually needs to be need to be real, it cannot be uh, imaginary or complex. Okay. Now also, all quantum states are normalized, which is just a convention that we choose. So that later on, when we determine probabilities for readouts, for measurements and stuff, um, it becomes easier. So our convention is that for any state, it holds that if I take the inner product of some state psi with itself, we want to get one. So for example, if I look at a superposition state psi, that is superposition of zero and one, an equal superposition, then I need to normalize it, in this case with one over square root of two, so that if I take the inner product, I'm getting one, and then written as a vector, this would be that vector. Good, so then some mathematical, nice um, thing that holds is what we call spectral decomposition, which you might remember from the new algebra, which in this case means that for every density matrix, rho, there exists an orthonormal basis So a set of vectors i that are all normalized and orthogonal, such that we can write this row as a sum over all the different lambda i times these vectors i, and then as matrices. So we take ket i bra i where then the i's are the eigenstates and the lambda i are the eigenvalues. And all lambda i sum up to one. Also, as we said before, all eigenvalues, it has, has to be a positive matrix. So all eigenvalues need to be larger than zero which then implies that if they all sum up to one, every eigenvalue needs to be smaller or equal than one. They cannot be larger than one. So the next thing is the definition of a pure matrix, a, a pure density matrix. So a density matrix is called pure. I've used that word actually before, maybe if you've noticed it when I defined zero and one, up here. So density matrix is called pure if we can write it as ket psi bra psi for any psi. And if it's not pure, it is called mixed. So, if rho is pure, then according to the spectral decomposition that I just introduced here, we know that we can we know that we can always find a decomposition in this form. If it's now pure, that means that we have exactly one eigenvalue that is one.
and all other eigenvalues therefore must be zero. So they add up to one. If one eigenvalue is one and all others are zero, that means that if I take the trace of rho squared, which equals just the sum of all the eigenvalues squared, well, if one of them is one and all others are zero, then this sum would always equal one in the case where rho is pure. However, for a general density matrix, all the lambda i sum up to one and are all smaller equal than one. So in the, in the other case, where we have multiple eigenvalues that are zero, this tra the trace of rho squared would then be smaller than one for a mixed state. I hope this was not, was not too mathematical intense so far, but let me give you some examples to hopefully make it a bit clearer. So the first example is the density matrix one, zero, zero, zero. And all what we learned before, when I defined it actually here, this is exactly, this corresponds exactly to cat zero, bra zero. And well, by the definition of a pure matrix, this is it would exactly correspond to just psi being zero. So this is a pure matrix. And analogously also the same would hold for that white matrix, which is just one one. It's also pure. That's why I also already defined it here as pure states. Um now the second example is one half times one zero zero one. That's again a density matrix. It's also positive and uh, the trace sums up to one. That's why we have this factor of one half before, so that the two diagonal elements sum up to one. And it's permission as well. So if we we can write this again in the direct notation. Then we get here zero zero plus one one, the two diagonal elements. And what we can see in the spectral decomposition, this is just it means that lambda, the first lambda, the first eigenvalue equals one half, and the second one as well. So we have two eigenvalues of one half, and the tray, and then if we square each of them, if we look at this, this would give us well one quarter plus one quarter, so clearly smaller than one. So this is a mixed state. And now let's look at a third example. So we have again the prefactor of one half to have a normalized state. And now we're looking at this density matrix. And I think it's again a good idea to first rewrite it in direct notation. Also that way we become more familiar with it. So we can yeah, the first element is plus one, then the second, the element zero, one, actually negative, and whether we have a minus one, so we get the minus sign, and minus one, zero, and again, plus one, one on the diagonal. And this might not give you an idea immediately, you might not immediately see what it, this can be rewritten as, but if we look carefully, we can see that we can write it as zero minus one cat and cats times zero minus one of brass and actually we could even write you know, one over square root of two here and one over square root of two here so we see that now this could be our this would be our psi or cat and this would be the bra so it is exactly of the form of a pure state that we have here so this is actually a pure state. Good. Now, the reason we look at, so what, what is the difference physically in, between a pure and a mixed state? A pure state is a state where we have all, in, where we have all information, where we know exactly which state it is in. For the state zero and one, this is clear. We know it's in state zero. We know it's in state one. For the superposition state, that might not be immediately clear because it seems like, oh, it's in a superposition, so I don't know whether it's in zero or in one. 
But that's not true. We actually know that, for example, in the last example, it is in the state 0 minus 1, which, by the way, would be very different from being in the state 0 plus 1. But we know exactly that the state we are in is 0 minus 1, and we could apply some operations to, for example, bring it back to state 0 or 1. And we have always we have full knowledge about the state. The second example, however, the mixed state, that's an example where we do not know which state we're in. We're not in a superposition state there, but we are with probability one half in state zero and with probability one half in state one. So we actually have no idea. There's no way that we can apply operations to get more knowledge about that state. And we just don't know which state we're in, which is pretty bad for computation if you don't know which state you're in. It's not like superposition because we cannot make use of this. There's no knowledge that we can make use of, unlike for the superpositions. So for quantum computing, in the ideal case, we would always only work with pure states, which is why also in the next few lectures, we will only consider pure states. So instead of then writing down the density matrix as psi psi or something, I would just always only refer to psi as our quantum state, and that would imply that we're looking at the that we the density matrix would be cat psi bra psi. So we're only going to look at pure states, but the reason I introduced the mixed states already is well, because first of all, of course, it's good if you know that this also exists. We might not always have full knowledge about our states, but then also you will need it for the next for, for a lecture, one of the later next lectures that is about error correction. Because once we have some noise and some errors, that means we have noise, means that we have some that we don't know the state fully, that there might be some things that we don't know about, that there's some uncertainty, and this is exactly becoming a mixed state. So once we get some noise, we get some mixed states, and for that you will need this notation of density matrices and mixed states again. But yeah, for the next few hours, let's just consider pure states, and we just consider cats for that. Okay, so let us continue with the next um, point, which are the measurements. In order to describe quantum states and also to measure quantum states, then we usually choose orthogonal bases. The measurements are then what we call projective measurements. So during a measurement, onto some basis, for example, onto the basis, let's say zero one, which is the basis that we mostly choose. And that's the one that actually physically is the one that makes most sense. During such a me measurement, as I mentioned earlier, our state will actually collapse. And it will collapse into either of the of its eigenstates. So if we do a measurement onto projective measurement onto the basis zero one, we will measure it will collapse either to state zero or to state one. Which are the two eigenstates? of the poly Z operator that you might have seen before. So poly Z, we will learn about that later when we talk about gates. So poly Z matrix is actually that one. And if you determine the eigenstates of this matrix, you will get exactly our vectors that correspond to the quantum states zero and one. So zero and one are the two eigenstates of this operator, which is why we call the measurement to the computational basis, as we would also call it on the so onto the basis zero one, we call this a Z measurement. However, in theory at least, there are infinitely many different bases. But of course, not all of them are commonly used. 
So there's actually a few others that are common. So other common ones are the plus minus bases, where the plus state is just the equal superposition of zero and one without any phase. So we just have zero plus one. And then we have the minus state, which is also superposition of zero and one. However, here we have a minus phase. So instead of zero plus one, we have the state zero minus one. That's why it's a minus state. And you can easily check if you take the inner product of plus and minus of these two states, that this will give zero. So these two states are actually orthogonal. So this phase is very important. And then another common basis is what we call the plus i minus i basis, which sometimes is also called left and right, but well, I'll go for plus and minus now. And here we have again a superposition of zero and one, but this time the phase between them is i. So we have zero plus i times one, the imaginary i. And then minus i is zero minus i times one. And again, you can easily check that these two are orthogonal. And now why the, I guess the main reason why these two are two other common bases are that these correspond to the eigenstates of sigma x and sigma y. So the other two poly operators which is why we call it then the X measurement or Y measurement. Now, in order to determine um, how likely an output is, how likely it is, if I give you a state and you want to measure it in a given basis, what are the probabilities to get each output? We use the so-called Born rule. The Born rule tells us that the probability that some given state psi, psi is just a favorite Greek letter to describe quantum states, um, the probability that this collapses during a projective measurement that we do onto some arbitrary basis let's call the state x and then we have some other arbitrary state x orthogonal which is orthogonal to state x and now the, so the probability that the state psi if i do a projective measurement onto this basis collapses to the state x because it could now either collapse into x or into x orthogonal, is given by p of x. And this is the projection of psi onto x, which is so the inner product between x and psi. And then we take the absolute value and square it. And since we have um, normalized states, this is, doesn't need to be normalized or anything, but all probabilities directly add up to one as expected. So let's go through some examples to get more familiar with the Born rule. So the first example is the state zero plus square root of two times one. So you see, actually, it doesn't always have to be an equal superposition, but we can have more weight on zero on one, of course. And now this would not be a normalized state. So we normalize with one over square root of three so that the inner product is one and that it's normalized. So this is the given state. And let's say we measure it just in the normal basis. So in the, we do a C measurement meaning we project onto the zero one basis. Then the probability to measure the state zero is given by the projection of that state to zero. 
and we take the absolute value squared. Now we can write it as two different terms. So let's get the prefactors out. One over square root of three times zero, zero, plus square root of two over three times the inner product of zero and one. And now remember that states are normalized. So the inner product of any state with itself is one. While zero and one are orthogonal states, which means that their inner product is zero. So what we get, this term just disappears and we just get one over three, one third. And then it immediately follows that the probability to get to measure state one is two thirds because they need to add up to one. But you could of course also, uh, also analogously check that if you project it onto state one, you get two thirds. Now let's look at a second example. The second example is we're given the state zero minus one. And we measure it this time in a different basis. This time we choose the x basis to measure it. So we measure in the basis plus minus. Then the probability to measure, let's say, the plus state is given by yeah, projecting psi to plus. So if we rewrite it, we get for plus, we get just the zero plus one times one over square root of two, and then another one over square root of two from the state psi. Here we have zero minus one, absolute value squared and get the prefactors out, so we get one quarter. And now we can write it as four terms. We have zero, zero, minus zero, one, plus one, zero, minus one, one, squared. And as before, we can check, we know this is one, this is zero, this is zero, this is one. So we get one minus one, so we end up with zero. And we actually see that the faces are indeed very important because here we can see that the faces lead to the fact that it can, to the inner product cancels and we get zero in the end. However, this zero is actually very much expected because um, if we look at what we just calculated, we took the inner product of psi and plus but psi, if you notice it, is exactly what I defined earlier here as the minus state. So we actually took the inner product of plus and minus. And I told you all the bases are orthogonal bases and plus and minus are orthogonal states. So if they're orthogonal, then the inner product is of course zero. And then of course, if I, on the opposite, if I try to determine the probability to measure the minus state, we would just get minus minus squared, which gives one, also as expected. And we see, of course, the probabilities add up to one. So if I'm already in a state in which I, if I'm already in a state on which, which is part, which is an eigenstate. So for example, if I'm in the minus state like here and I'm measuring in a basis where minus is an eigenstate, like in the plus minus basis, then I will with certainty always measure the minus state. There's no way that I could then measure the plus state. So same for zero and one. If I, if I am already in state one, then there's no way if I do a zero one measurement that I measure zero. I mean, unless there's noise, but ideally not. That's why we're considering pure states, right? <laughs> okay, so much about measurements. And now as a last thing for this hour, I wanna show you an illustrative way to think of these quantum states, which is the so-called Bloch sphere. So if we consider our states that are normalized and pure, we can write any of them as 
Oh, let's choose again. Sorry. Cosine of theta over 2 times 0 plus sine of theta over 2 times 1. Oh, sorry. I'm actually missing an important part. Um, plus e to the i phi times sine of theta over 2 times 1. Where the phi can run from 0 to 2 pi and describes the relative phase. So this is exactly what leads to these interference effects where we have, for example, could have zero plus one or zero minus one or zero plus i times one. So you see the e to the i phi does not give us any absolute, is on, the absolute value is always one, but it gives us some complex phase. And so the, so the relative phase between the two states. And then we have the angle theta, which goes from zero to pi, and which determines the probability to measure zero or one. So it basically tells us how much, like it gives the weight between the states zero and one. So, because if we apply the Born rule, now the probability to measure state zero would just be, well, the projection of psi to zero. So we just, and so taking the absolute value squared, we would just get cosine squared of theta over two and the probability to measure one would be sine squared of theta over two. So all these states, as you can see, can just be described by two variables. In this case, phi and theta. Which means that we can actually illustrate them on the surface of a sphere. which is a two-dimensional object with radius one, which is something that comes from the normalization that we implied. And this is this sphere where we plot all those states is what we call the Bloch sphere. The question is, where do we put these states? If I give you a sphere, how do you relate the state as given above, defined by with the angles theta and phi, how do you put them onto the Bloch sphere? And so the coordinates are just given by what we buy the typical spherical uh coordinates the coordinates of such a state are given by what we call the Bloch vector so we call it the Bloch vector r and here you have the typical spherical coordinates sinus theta cosine phi sinus theta sinus phi sine phi and cosine of theta and you will see that actually these so these theta and the phi correspond just to the way we in this just to the states the phi and theta in the state in the general formula above so let's plot the Bloch sphere and show some examples on it. Let me try to draw a sphere. Not so nice. So let's try again to draw a nice sphere. Okay.
So we have our three axes, the y axis, and z axis, and the x axis. And well, it's normalized, so we have said so we have a radius of one. So this is our sphere. And now we have our, let's start with the state zero. For the state zero, if we consider now the general description I gave here, here, we see that we would need that cosine of theta over two should be one. So we require that theta is just zero. And phi can actually then be just arbitrary. And if we now put that into our Bloch vector, we will get 0, 0, and 1. So in the coordinates here on the Bloch sphere, this corresponds to the state up here. Then let's look at state 1. For state 1, well, according to our general formula, we now need that sine of theta over 2 equals 1. So we need that theta equals pi. Again, phi can be arbitrary. And the block vector that we then get is 0, 0, and minus 1. Which means that on the block sphere, the state 1 is at the bottom. Next, let's look at the state plus that we've seen already as well. So plus means that we want to be in equal superposition of zero and one, so zero plus one with no phase. So equal superposition means cosine of theta over two and sine of theta over two both need to be the same and need to be one over square root of two. So we need theta to be pi over two. And since we want no phase, but we just want zero plus one, we require that phi equals to zero in this case which gives us the block vector 1, 0, 0. So it's actually on the x-axis. And then we have the minus state, which is very similar, so the theta is the same, but now we want 0 minus 1, and for that we need pi equal to pi. And then we get the vector minus 1, 0, 0. So it's also on the x-axis, but on the opposite side. And then let's look at the other. I told you before, there's like th three common bases. So let's look at the third common basis, the plus and minus i states. Again, we need the equal superposition. So theta stays the same. But for phi, in order to get this phase of plus or minus i, we need pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, respectively. And then the two vectors that we get are, you could probably already guess it by now, it's 0, 1, 0, and 0, minus 1, 0. So we have here the minus i state, and here we get the plus i state. One thing that you should be very careful about, maybe you've just noticed that, is that on the block sphere, all angles are twice as large as they are in Hilbert space. So Hilbert space is like the mathematical description where we write the vectors and everything. So there, here, they are twice as large. For example, if you look at the states 0 and 1, which we know in Hilbert space are orthogonal, here on the Bloch sphere, they're not orthogonal anymore, but the angle between them is actually 180 degrees. So 
So if I consider a general state, I told you before, we can write that as psi equal to cosine of theta over two times zero plus and so on. And so now theta here corresponds to the angle on the Bloch sphere. What theta over two, so that here, this is the actual angle in Hilbert space. So you might have already wondered why we define it with pi phi, uh, theta over two and not with theta, but it's exactly because this way we plotted on the Bloch sphere that theta corresponds to the coordinates here, just as we know it from spherical coordinates. Mm. And theta over two is the actual angle. So importantly, what you can see here is that all the, everything that is on one axis are orthogonal states. So zero and one are orthogonal, plus and minus are orthogonal, and plus i and minus i are also orthogonal. While for example, plus and one are not orthogonal. They, in Hilbert space, have an angle of 45 degrees. Now, what you might have noticed is that actually the states 0 and 1, which are the eigenstates of the poly z operator, as I mentioned before, they are lying on the z-axis. Then the eigenstates of the x poly x operator, which are plus and minus, are lying on the x-axis. And the same holds for the states plus i and minus i that are laying on the y-axis. So if I now tell you we're doing a z measurement, then you've learned that this corresponds to a projection onto the two eigenstates of the z poly z operator, which are the states 0 and 1. So it actually corresponds to a projection onto the z-axis. And the same holds for x and y. So if we, for example, have, if our state initially is the zero state, and we point up, so we point up here, then if we do a z measurement, it means we just collapse our state along the z-axis. And in this case, it would with certainty give us state zero. If, however, we do an X measurement, it means it could collapse either to state plus or to state minus. And it's exactly in the middle, so we would have equal probability to measure the plus state or the minus state. And then the same holds, for example, let's say if we have a state that is initially here, if we do a Z measurement, then we color, then we project onto the z-axis, so it has a very high chance to go up here to the zero state, and but it still has a very well a rather small chance to go down here, and that we could measure state one. If we measure, for example, if we do a y measurement, we project onto the y-axis, and we have a higher chance to measure minus i, but we also have quite some chance to measure plus i and so on. So this is a very nice and illustrative way of thinking of the quantum states and how to think about a measurement on the, of these states. Yeah, with this I'd like to end the first hour. I really hope you've enjoyed that already. I'm happy to answer your questions. And yeah, in the next hour we will then learn about the basic quantum gates and entanglement.